today we're in the middle of winter and we went back to Jing Mai and I'd like to take a look at one of our tea gardens. So this tea garden is called Liu Dui. It's a, a natural tea garden uh, just at the west of Tapingzhang in Jing Mai Mountain. So it's at a fairly high altitude, about 1,600 meters. And it's, uh, it's a tea garden we quite recently acquired. We've managed it for since uh, 2012, I think, and we bought it in 2016. And so uh, it's about one hectare in superficy. And so we could have a walk through that tea garden and have a look at uh, what can happen in a tea garden in winter. So first, what I'd like you to notice is the heavy leaf cover that you have. So um, it's called litter. It means that the, there's a lot of dead leaves on the ground and that those dead leaves will slowly transform into uh, organic matter into um, uh, to form a kind of mulch uh, on the on the ground so it covers the ground it, it is decaying slowly especially as we're in winter actually most of the decaying process occurs in um, in summer when it's rainy and hot it's cool to have that litter cover first because uh, as you can see here it prevents a lot of uh, weed to grow okay so when we have to clear the weed here, we have less work, and typically there's less competition here between the weed and the, and the tea trees if we don't cut the weed. So that's pretty cool. That's one thing. Second, it brings more biodiversity. In this, uh, in this litter, you have lots of small animals that live, and it's still always cool to have good biodiversity. It gives better resilience against um, pests and disease, and it also, uh, for some of them, can help improve our, our soil structure, uh, notably worms that will crawl through the, the soil. But the main point of having a good litter is that then you get a lot of organic matter, and when you have that organic matter, uh, well, let's take a look. So I have my, uh, the layer of litter here, and below it is my topsoil. And you can see that my topsoil is very dark here. And if I dig in a little bit, uh, it's not extremely compressed. Well, it'd be good to, to uh, soften the soil at some point. So it just needs uh, a light work on the soil and that will make it more uh, fluffy. But what you can see in this soil is it's... Uh, so basically we're, we're quite at the top of the hill, so it's very sandy soil. So we don't have much clay in it, so it's not very uh, it's not very sticky. But one big advantage in the, this type of soil of having a high amount of organic matter is that you can really take advantage of the few clay you have. Organic matter. So this is the stuff that makes the the soil dark. Okay, it's basically a mix of dead leaves, dead animals, dead uh, anything, anything made of carbon. So this organic matter will combine with the, the few clay that is available in the soil and will make a complex that will, um, that will be able to hold much more nutrients and water than if we didn't have that organic matter. If you have only clay, it's cool because it can hold a lot of nutrients, but definitely not as much as if, as if it is combined with organic matter. It helps a lot to retain water and nutrients and so that helps for soil fertility and it's ex extremely helpful at those high altitudes where we typically have a very poor soil which is mostly made of sand. Now the second stuff, the good stuff about organic matter is that it gives a nice structure to the soil. You can see that the agglomerates in the soil are like little, well, little spheres uh, you can see that clearly when it's zoom in and uh, it's pretty cool because it allows the air to go through your soil will not be easily waterlogged not that waterlogging is a big problem here because as I said we have a lot of sand but um, it's also nice that it can both hold a lot of water while not being uh, waterlogged so waterlogging means that uh, the air cannot go uh, cannot go through the soil. The roots of the tea trees need to breathe, so if air is inaccessible, then they will have a big problem for growing. Uh, that's a problem that typically occurs at low altitude, but yeah, it's a small bonus here. 
So um, yeah, we're happy we have lots of organic matter here. Let's go on the next topic. You can see in this part of the garden, it's quite heavily shaded. You can see all of those, um, all of those shade trees. So the big plus, as I showed you, is that we get a lot of organic matter. We get a nice litter on the floor. So that, that brings us a better soil quality. And of course, the, the downside is that we're at high altitude. It's not particularly hot, but we don't have a lot of sunlight. We have less sunlight than if we didn't have those shade trees, obviously and that will probably hinder the, the yield because uh, at high altitude, if temperatures are not very high, it's usually preferable not to have uh, shade trees if you want to have a higher yield. While at low altitude, where it's very hot, it can be much better to, to have shade trees in order to avoid photorespiration. But we'll talk about that subject another day. So in this part, again, you can see that we have a very thick litter and we have very few uh, weed growing. So this part of our tea garden is not as heavily shaded as the one you've seen before uh, and it's mainly shaded by, tr by trees that uh, lose their leaves in winter. The cool thing about having trees that don't have leaves all year round is that you don't have leaves in early spring and so that's a big plus if you want to have a higher yield in, um, in early spring. Uh, and then they will, get, they will get the leaves as soon as the, the rainy season comes. So because we have a thinner litter on this soil, uh, you can see that the, the weed have grown uh, higher than in the other parts of the gardens, okay? Because they are not covered by the litter and they are more uh, free to grow. Or at least some, of, some, of, some species that wouldn't be able to, to go through the litter in the, in the other part of the garden will be able to thrive here, such as this, uh, this weed that we can find everywhere. So the question is, should we cut this weed now or should we wait until later? For example, should we wait until uh, early spring, until the, the beginning of the harvest to cut that weed? And I, I spent the whole day, the whole afternoon thinking about this problem. Okay, so here it is. If we cut the weed now, we'll probably have them decaying over the winter and then the, the nutrients will be available in early spring. Actually, they, so the, we, we cut the weed now. It will decay slowly, okay? And its nutrients will go into the soil. Uh, especially the, the nitrogen goes quite fast into the soil. When, when the stuff is green, it means nitrogen is still in the, in the plant. And when it has turned brown, it means that the nitrogen has already uh, gone into the soil. Okay, for the rest of the nutrients, it usually takes uh, longer. So if you cut them now, maybe in two months, at the beginning of the harvest, the nitrogen will already be available in the soil and that will give better fertilization to our tea trees. So the other option is to cut the weed in early spring. Okay, let, the, let them grow over winter. So the, the plus is that then you, you don't leave your soil uncovered during the winter. There's a, a basic principle in, um, in agroecology that says you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't leave a soil uncovered. Think about it like this. The sun is your source of energy and it's shooting at the soil and uh, you want to take advantage of that energy source. If it lights up some empty soil, then it's quite useless. The, the energy will be scattered in the atmosphere. But if you have plants on it, part of this energy will be captured and so some carbon will be captured from the atmosphere and you'll be able to use it in the soil. And as, as we just saw, it's good to have organic matter. It's good to have carbon in your soil that gives it better nutrient and water holding capacities and also structural advantages. So using this principle, maybe it would make more sense to let this wheat grow over the winter because tea doesn't grow. So we don't really care about competition with wheat during the winter and then maybe cut it in uh, mid-February just before we, we start harvesting the tea. So I asked a few farmers around here and they will say that it mainly depends on their time available. If they have time to do it now, they do it now. If they don't have time or don't want to, they will do it later. And this, uh, this idea of uh, nutrients availability is not really considered here. Actually, it'd be cool to, have to do the experiment and to compare those, uh, those two things. But if you're a tea grower watching me, I, I would love to know 
how you make that decision, when do you cut the weed in your tea garden? Um, does it only depend on the workforce available or do you take other parameters into consideration? And I was also thinking that maybe, maybe if, I, if, I, if we cut it now, actually they, they won't have decayed really. Uh, I'm not sure the, the cold and dry winter will be enough to have the, the nutrients transferred from the plants to the, um, to the soil. What you should know is when you add some green stuff like some mulch, compost or you add some manure on the soil, the short term effect is you actually have less nutrients available in the soil. Fungi and bacteria will grow to decay the stuff you just put in. Those living microorganisms will take up nut nutrients just to grow and actually you have a negative balance in the short term. If you need short term fertilization, you should use mineral fertilizer, you shouldn't use organic fertilizer because organic fertilizer will give you a negative balance in the short term. So you can see a lot of uh, black spots and they are actually, uh, I guess, um, fungi, fungi colonies that develop on the leaves. So what they do typically is that they stick on the leaf and they try to get in the leaves by growing some kind of tentacles in the leaves and they enter the, the leaf cells and, and suck in the, the energy that they get. Fungi are heterotrophic stuff so they, they need to eat the carbon so they are basically eating the leaf. So usually you get those disease at certain times in the year, more often in summer, uh, autumn and winter, very rarely in early spring. This is mainly due to the, the dryness we have in early spring. Okay, usually the disease uh, become a problem when you have a high humidity, humidity in the tea garden. So now we're getting drier and drier at this time of the year. We're in the middle of January. So we don't need to worry that much about the, the presence of this disease in our tea gardens now because it's not a harvesting period and well uh, it's, it's not very threatening to the, the survival of the tea tree at this point. Now the, the climate is getting drier and drier and probably this stuff will die out when they won't have enough humidity in the air to, to survive. Okay, So it's typical at the end of autumn to have a lot of disease in the tea garden and it doesn't mean we have to do anything about it actually. So you can see like for example these leaves are interesting. Uh, you could think that uh, this leaf is harvestable but if you touch it it's way too rough actually to be made into uh, any tea, you know. So usually we harvest the grade according to the tenderness of the leaf and not really um, according to the fact that it's one bud and two leaves or things like that. You really have to check at the, the tenderness. So uh, at this time of the year we couldn't really, uh, well we could harvest those teas but it would probably be all uh, Huangpian, all, all yellow flakes, okay? You can also see that uh, this tea leaf is turning red on the sides. That could be a sign of uh, phosphorus deficiency or anything else, maybe some kind of disease or... Um, I don't know exactly, but I've seen quite a few, a few leaves having that color at this time of the year. I know in some parts of um, the world, especially, uh, close to the, um, well, in very cold regions, like in, um, like, uh, like in Canada or Sweden, um, you'd have uh, a lot of the leaves would turn red like this at the approach of winter because they, they, they would need to get back their nutrients before, um, before having the snow falling on them. But it's probably not the case here because we don't really care about snow here. You can also see here that um, the tea trees are a bit smaller than the other parts of our garden and this is done on purpose actually. This is in order to, um, to stagger the, the harvest actually, to delay. Well, this is, we prune it more heavily here in order to have an earlier harvest than in the rest of our garden and that helps us spray the work over a, a few days because, well, at the coming of, at the coming of spring we will have this, this garden that will sprout first. Once we'll have finished harvesting here, typically the rest of the gardens will sprout. So it's pretty cool because then maybe we'll have one week for harvesting the whole garden instead of three, four days. So this is some of the techniques you can use in your tea garden. If you have a lot of tea gardens and uh, not enough workforce, you can use pruning to uh, delay 
uh, or advance some of the, the harvesting seasons and that will help you spread out the work. So this is about the end of our tour. I just came across those, those tea trees that are very tender so it's quite unusual to find such tender leaves in the middle of winter. Actually we, we could make tea with that. Uh, I'm not sure we're gonna do that because wow it's really really flashing that a lot like in early spring. That's very interesting. Oh, also you can see that you don't find any spiders at this time of the year because they have already died. Their cycle is they start to grow in the early spring but at that time they are very very small and uh, well you can see them well once the rain arrives and they will live until the end of autumn and then they will just die. So that's our protection during the, the whole rainy season. That's how the, a lot of the pests are stopped. They are just trapped into the, the spider nets. Um, yeah, so that's about it for today. I think we're gonna go home. There's not much to do really in the tea gardens in winter. We could prune, we could weed, and uh, we could also till the ground if we wanted to make nutrients more available. Usually these things are made uh, towards the end of uh, towards the end of winter actually as the harvest approaches people will usually be more active in February okay so thank you for watching and have a great winter and see you again bye bye